So let me start again by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a historian who is obviously far better at history than I am at technology. And, um, and what I am doing in these Thursday midday chats is to take people who might be at home bored uh, through a look at American history. And I'm following the idea that America is based on a paradox, the idea that equality for uh, the founders and since then has been tied to the idea that equality for certain people depends on inequality for others. And in the first, uh, the first lecture I did uh, two weeks ago, I set that idea up. The, and the last week I set up the idea that the uh, oligarchs in the South before the Civil War managed to leverage that idea of an American paradox to say that if others got rights, white men would lose them, and how, based on that ideology, they managed to take over the American government in the 1850s until they were finally put back uh, and pushed back by the version of American democracy embraced by American, uh, embraced by Abraham Lincoln. The idea that I mean, true American democracy means equality of opportunity for everybody, not simply for white men. Um, now, I'm going to expand on that today and talk about how that played out. But first, I want to do a short disclaimer. Again, my name is Heather Richardson, Heather Cox Richardson, I write under, and I'm a history professor. I do not speak for my employer. And what I'm doing in these talks is to um, to expand on a certain version of American history, a certain argument of American history. And that's going to um, to be different than you would hear from somebody else. And it's going to include a lot of things that you might have never heard before. And it's going to exclude a lot of things that you might be expecting to hear. So let me pick up where I was last week. And again, apologies for those of you who couldn't find me. Again, I was broadcasting on the wrong, uh, the wrong Facebook page. Um, so where I wanted, what I want to do today is to pick up uh, where I left off last week. And if you remember where I left off last week, I talked about how uh, oligarchs in the Confederacy had tried to take over American government to, um, to make their version of American democracy universal. They wanted to define a democracy in such a way that it meant human enslavement. And people like Abraham Lincoln pushed back against that and said, no, that's not what American democracy is all about. American democracy is about producing equality of opportunity for everybody, including um, people at the bottom, especially people at the bottom, because that's the way society moves forward best. And so, um, so I, I talked about how that plays out during the Civil War and how by 1865, Republicans in charge of the American government include African American men. And what I didn't talk a lot about was how after 1865, but, but dramatically after the 14th Amendment in 1868, that vision increasingly also includes women. Women begin to argue for the right to have a say in American society. And in 1869, they organized two suffragist associations that are going to join together much later in 1890, which is when most people hear of them. But they're really part of that immediate post-war push for universal equality. And you see that its high watermark really is in 1870. And it seems right there like the Lincolnian version of American democracy ought to have won. But something happens after the Civil War that changes the entire equation. And what that is, is there's a, a conjunction right in 1865, 1866, 1867, between the end of the Civil War and this new flowering of American equality, and the fact that Americans move west. They move west across the Mississippi River in, in increasingly large numbers after 1865. And that conjunction of the move west is going to create a situation with the end of the Civil War, is going to create a situation where the oligarchical ideals of the Confederacy are going to find a natural new breeding ground. And what I want to do today is talk about why that's the case. And for a lot of you, this material is going to be new and interesting and, um, and a very different picture than what you've heard about in the East and what I've talked about happening in the East. And the first thing to remember, and the important thing to remember, is first of all, we have to go back earlier than the Civil War to understand why the move West made such a difference. And the first place to start is with the fact that the West has its own founding story that is completely different from that of the East. I've talked a lot about how um, 
in the East, the, the founding story comes from the idea of small farmers creating uh, fields in the wilderness and working their way up with their families around them. That's not the image of the West. The West's founding story is in people like Kit Carson and uh, Davy Crockett who are frontiersmen and whose fame really takes off in American mythology with things like the Alamo. These are images of brave white men who are bringing religion and commerce to lands that are defined as savage. And that difference in, um, in the definition of a founding story between the East and the West is going to matter a lot. Now, it's important to remember that the West uh, doesn't start at all with the Alamo. The West has its own long history and long set of traditions, beginning with the indigenous peoples who live there, and then uh, with the Spanish who um, took over the, the indigenous regions in the 1500s, and then finally with the stories and the traditions and the laws of the Mexicans who create their own nation after 1821 when they push back colonial Spanish rule. But it's also important to remember that when the Americans come in from the East, they create their own mythology and they bring their own ideas with them. So let me take you through a bit of that. Americans begin to dream about the West even before the, imagine, even before the American Revolution. And one of their chief grievances actually against England is the fact that the English government gets really tired of Americans crossing the Appalachian Mountains because every time they do that, they stir up trouble with the indigenous people who live on the other side of the mountains. And then the British have to step in and clean up the mess. So in 1763, the British um, make a proclamation that colonials can't cross the Appalachian Mountains. And this is absolutely not gonna fly with the colonials who have every intention of crossing the Appalachian Mountains. So some people like uh, Daniel Boone, who was a Virginian and kind of a, a ne'er-do-well guy, um, kind of a backwoodsman guy, um, he repeatedly crosses the Appalachians. And in 1775, he actually crosses over them with a settlement, with a group of people. And they make a settlement uh, in the west, in the western part of Virginia, in the region known as Kentucky. Well, uh, three years after the Revolutionary War ends in, ends in, um, in 1784, a land speculator who owns land out where Boone was, was looking around writes what is essentially a, a pamphlet to get people to go out to the western part of Virginia and to buy land there. And it's called the present state of Kentucky. And in that present state of Kentucky, he describes what Western land is like. And in that, he, he talks about endless fields and, and, and dirt that is so uh, incredibly rich that you have to, to farm it for years before it becomes weak enough to produce uh, a normal crop. And fish that almost literally jump into your nets. It's this picture of this, this bountiful paradise where anybody can make it and anybody can rise. And at the end of this pamphlet, he has a section describing what it's like to live out there. And the featured character in that section is Daniel Boone. And that's why we know the name Daniel Boone is because of his being highlighted as this frontiersman who tames the wilderness and provides civilization and, um, sort of uh, 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 an American version of the nobleness of the West. So Boone kind of brings together the wildness of the American West with a civilization of it, a, a settlement of it. And it becomes a well-known image of what the American West could be. Now, that sort of travels through American mythology even early on, but it also travels into American government because of course, people are looking at this and looking at what's happening out in the western part of Virginia, the Kentucky region of Virginia. There is a land rush into that area, uh, a land rush, by the way, that will take Abraham Lincoln's grand, our Abraham Lincoln's grandfather out into uh, Kentucky. That's how our Abraham Lincoln and Lincoln's family ends up in Kentucky. But it also filters back into the east through government because uh, Thomas Jefferson gets obsessed with the West, or maybe is obsessed with the West. He grows up in the western part of Virginia, is always fascinated by what lies over those mountains. And he actually uh, serves in the Virginia State Legislature um, in the early 1780s with Daniel Boone. So he clearly has heard about what that West might be like. And he's been fascinated by it even before Americans write the Constitution 
when when Jefferson is the the foreign minister to France under the Articles of Confederation, he actually convinces an American explorer from Connecticut, a guy named John Ledyard, to try and see what the American West is like by going east from Russia uh, back into the uh, across the Pacific and into the American West that way. And Ledyard actually tries it, but Catherine the Great wants no part of it, and she kicks him. She kicks him out and he dies in Egypt. So that never happens. But as soon as he becomes president in 1801, Jefferson undertakes the task again. He asks Congress in January of 1803 for uh, uh, money. He writes him a secret memo asking them for money to fund an expedition to travel up the Mississippi River and then up the Missouri River to talk to indigenous peoples and to see what the land looks like. And what he really wants to do is to make sure that the, uh, or to try and get the indigenous people to stop trading their furs with Britain and instead start trading them with America. But uh, he also wants to see what's out there. And Congress agrees. They fund the request. And this is how we get the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. Those are the people that Jefferson taps to, to, do this, um, to do this exploration. Mind you, again, at the time when he's planning this, this is over land that does not belong to the United States of America. Um, but that's going to change. In 1803, um, uh, America buys the, uh, the buys the Louisiana Territory, and the Louisiana Territory is essentially the the um, state of Louisiana in a V up to what is now the Canadian border, and it doubles the territory of the original thirteen colonies, and uh, and creates the means that the land that. Lewis and Clark are supposed to be traveling over a lot of that now is American territory, so. This big doubling of America um, means that more of the American West has come under the purview of the American government. And after the Lewis and Clark expedition sets off, um, Jefferson continues to send more and more expeditions to see what the West is like, really notably under Zebulon Pike. And he sends Zebulon Pike up first to find the headwaters of the Mississippi River, and then on a couple of expeditions to explore the limits of Mexican territory, and uh, I'm sorry, Spanish territory at the time, and the Spanish turn, turn Pike back. But both Pike and then the Lewis and Clark expedition come back to the American East with all kinds of specimens and stories and journals about what the American West looks like. And Jefferson is so fascinated by these that he actually turns an anteroom in the White House into a Western, uh, a Western museum, if you will. And he has the enslaved people in the White House arranging buffalo heads on the walls and a table full of pottery and arrowheads. And he even... Um, uh, keeps a couple of caged grizzly bears on the front lawn of the White House so that people can actually see what what the West might look like. And um, this whole kind of uh, fascination with the American West is one of the things that helps to boost the candidacy of Andrew Jackson for the presidency in um, 1828. He is, as I said last week, a Southerner. He's a Southern slave owner, and he that's really where his base of power is. But his sort of backwoods, rough frontiersman demeanor that comes to popular prominence after the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, happening after the end of the Battle of, uh, of the War of 1812, but really hitting the American consciousness as the triumph of that war. Mind you, the war was over when it happened, but it was a major battle that rockets um, Andrew Jackson to prominence and, and kind of gives Americans the sense of their future being part of the West. Well, what happens with the end of the War of 1812, after 1815, is that economic boom I talked about last week in a different contest, an, a context, an economic boom that inspires Americans to believe that they are destined to move West into this new Louisiana territory and beyond. And with the, uh, the indigenous peoples and the British pushed back away from the Western frontier, Americans increasingly push into the West and into new cotton lands, especially, as I talked about last week, after the, the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears in 1830. But for my purposes today, the place we want to start for the, the foundation of the American West is not with the Eastern expansion, but rather with the Western expansion. And that takes off dramatically after 1821, when Mexico throws off the Spanish rule, the colonial Spanish rule, and, um, and, uh, and begins to welcome 
trade with the Americas. And the way that that trade happens, and, and by the way, on the other video that I may or may not figure out how to post somewhere, I told a, a, a personal story about this. The way this happens is after 1821, when the Mexicans throw off the Spanish colonial rule, Americans, Mexicans, and Comanches begin to trade along the Santa Fe Trail. And the Santa Fe Trail stretches from uh, uh, Missouri, from St. Louis, Missouri to Santa Fe, obviously, and then drops straight down into Mexico. It's actually a different trail name uh, when it goes down into Mexico. But from Missouri to Santa Fe, New Mexico, that uh, trail is a trading trail. So Mexicans, Comanches, and Americans are all trading along the Santa Fe Trail after 1821. And what that means is that Mexicans begin to move uh, Mexican goods out of uh, Mexico into the American East. It also means something interesting for American history that I will not go into today. And that is that traders come uh, come down the, the, go west along the Santa Fe Trail and they cut up into the mountains. So from the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, and into the 1850s, we get traders like Kit Carson, for example, cutting up into the mountains and becoming fur traders. And this is where we get fur trapping and fur trading and the mountain men as early symbols of American heroes and American Westerners. It comes out of the Santa Fe Trail and that poke up there into the mountains to trap furs. So while Americans are starting to pay some attention to the, the trappers and the traders in the 30s and the 40s, um, uh, I'm going to take you down further south first, and and to do that, um, coming out, it's important to remember that coming out of the Santa Fe Trail, moving down south out of the Santa Fe Trail, there was never, it was never sure, it, the Americans were not sure in 1821 that the Mexicans were in fact going to let them trade along the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, it was unclear that that was going to happen, but the Mexicans are actually quite willing to welcome the Americans into uh, what is then Mexican territory, but into the land of Texas, because they're interested in trying to stabilize that region uh, against the Comanches, because the Com it's really Comanche territory. The Comanches run an empire in the center of the, of the country, of the center of the plains there, known as Comancheria. And they trade uh, cattle and later captives both, along, both um, south into Mexico and east back into the American East. And Mexico is perfectly happy to have Americans come into Texas and settle that land. So they encourage Texans to come, uh, Americans to come into Texas, and Americans are eager to do so because after, as I say, the opening of the southeastern lands with the uh, uh, Indian and Removal Act, the Texas, uh, I'm sorry, the, the southern expansion of cotton is moving throughout the southwest and it moves into Texas. So there's a problem here because Southern white men are moving their version of democracy into Texas, into Mexican territory. And in 1830, Mexico outlaws human enslavement. So now you've got those white Anglo-Americans who have moved into Texas to spread their cotton plantations into that region. And Mexico has said that their system of labor, their enslaved system of labor, is no longer legal there. What happens then is that Americans joined together with Mexicans who oppose the government that has Im imposed this, uh, this law and a number of other laws they don't like as well, but this law against human enslavement. They, they joined together to oppose this government, uh, the government of Santa Ana, um, in October of, of 1835. And they joined together as a group called Texians to fight back against Santa Ana's troops. And by December of 1835, they have in fact pushed Santa Ana's troops out of Texas and 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 hunkered themselves down to to hold the ground for what they know is going to be an inevitable reprisal. They hunkered down near what is now San Antonio. They hunkered down in a mission, and that mission is, of course, the Alamo. They hunkered down in the Alamo mission near San Antonio, and this uh, this idea of these men hunkered down in this Alamo mission becomes the foundational point of American Western history. What happens is, of course, that 
Um, more Americans pour into the Alamo to hold this land against the Mexican government. Reminder here, it is actually Mexican territory and the Texians are fighting against the established Mexican government and they are doing so because they oppose that government's imposition of a law that says you can no longer enslave other people. That's not, of course, how the myth is going to go. But more Americans pour into the Alamo until about 200 people, including uh, David, as he is known then, Crockett. He becomes known in mythology as Davy Crockett, including David Crockett, um, stay in the, in the mission when 1,800 of Santa Ana's men surround it in February of 1836. And in March, on March 6, 1836, Santa Ana's troops attack the Alamo mission and they kill almost all of the defenders. They do not kill Davy Crockett. And it's important that they don't kill Davy Crockett and that everybody believes they did, because that is part of the myth of the Alamo, the idea that there, there was this brave group of uh, Americans who sacrificed themselves as great heroes in order to spread democracy into a benighted region. And in fact, uh, Crockett surrendered and he is, he is executed a couple of days later. And that is incontrovertible at this, uh, in, at this, at this point. Um, historian Jim Crisp has proved that pretty, pretty definitively. But a lot of people are not going to want to hear that because that image of the, the Alamo, the image of the Alamo as being this foundational event for American Western history, where these brave men take on savages who are threatening American democracy, becomes the foundational event for American history. Um, that idea of remembering the Alamo becomes central not only um, in the West in that period, but also in the East, as back East Americans start to think about how important it is for Americans to move West. And they might have a destiny, um, a manifest destiny even, a uh, God-given duty, not just a right, but a duty to spread democracy across the continent, because of course democracy is the American um, a discovery of the best form of human government, but also economy, to spend, spread the American economy across the continent, and then finally to spread American religion across the continent. Again, a fascinating thing because most of the Mexicans that they are fighting with at that point have converted to Catholicism, but the Christianity that is embodied in Manifest Destiny is Protestant Christianity. So this image of the American West um, becomes foundationally rooted in the idea of a man, as opposed to a farmer with his family, an individual frontiersman taking on, if you will, savages. Well, that plays out after the, um, after the Alamo in the 1840s. In 1846, uh, and I, I won't go into how this happens, but in 1846, America declares war on Mexico, and the U.S. troops move south, and they move south incredibly easily because the Comanches have, in fact, been raiding in the, the northern borderlands of Mexico, and as a result, there are very few people to stand against the Americans, but they don't know that. The, the troops don't know that at the time. The army doesn't know that at the time. They just think they're winning so dramatically in Mexico because they're better fighters and the Mexicans are running away. That's not what happened. But the, at the end of the Mexican War um, in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is going to change the American equation extraordinarily. Because what the treaty does, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo does, is it gives America that huge chunk of land uh, of the entire American Southwest. And that's land that is eventually going to become the states of California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico and Texas. And in exchange, it assumes some of Mexico's debt. But uh, this is going to be a game changer in American history because almost immediately, Americans are going to pour into that land because 10 days before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed, workers discover gold at Sutter's Mill in California. One of those the, one of those timing things in, Amer in, in world history, if the Mexicans had known there was gold in California, they would never have signed that treaty. You know, think if that gold had been discovered a month earlier and news had come out, but it wasn't. It was 10 days earlier. And with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, America now gets this giant chunk of land that is going to complete the American 
lower 48, not uh, Alaska and Hawaii, with the exception of the 1854 Gadsden Purchase, which I probably won't talk much about today. Although it's tempting because nobody's ever heard of Gadsden Purchase and this could be my great moment in the sun. But with the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, American territory gets very big very quickly. Now, I'm going to pick that up in a second, but it's important to remember when I talk about Western history that there is something very different about the American West than the American East, not only its foundational story, but also the indigenous peoples who live there. Because unlike in the East, the indigenous peoples who live in the Great Plains have horses. Horses are an absolute game changer because horses um, enable the Plains Indians to be extraordinarily formidable fighters. So how does this happen? Horses are not uh, native to the American um, to the American continent. We actually had them, uh, had giant horses way back in a previous era. But for our era, the horses uh, came with the Spanish. And the way I always figure it is that they come with the Spanish, and I always remember that jingle, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So that's how I remember 1492. But I always figure, and these are really loose numbers, I always figure that uh, horses crossed into what is now the continental U.S. in about 1500, and they travel to what is now the border of Canada in about 1776. Those are just ballpark figures that help me remember it um, because the actual dates don't matter terribly for what I do. But what you want to know is that these horses are moving up the plains from 1500 on. And almost immediately, as soon as they enter Plains Indian culture, they're big winners and they're big losers among the different tribes. But for a number of tribes who are going to be known as the horse, uh, the horse Indians, um, they are, the, it's a game changer to the point that the previously extraordinarily poor Indians who have had been having to um, to travel on foot, for example, to hunt, uh, to hunt bison or to hunt and gather, suddenly are horsed. And with horses, uh, they are able, first of all, to hunt uh, bison. And, and our buffalo, by the way, are not true buffalo. True buffalo are, you know, the, the, um, the water buffalo or the African um, Cape buffalo, the, those huge, extraordinarily dangerous animals. Uh, the American bison, it's called a buffalo, but the American buffalo's actually, uh, scientific name is actually bison bison, and it's a much smaller animal, still plenty big, but it's a much smaller animal and much faster on its feet. So with the, um, with the advent of horses, uh, Indians can hunt the bison much more effectively, and some tribes become exceedingly wealthy because of that. That's going to change their entire social structures, uh, and which I really don't have time to go into now, but for our purposes today, when Euro-Americans come in contact with those Plains Indians, what they're going to discover is they are very hard to find because they can move very quickly. They are also formidable fighters. So a Comanche, for example, can ride into battle with his leg slung over his pony. And by the way, these can be ponies, not horses. They're smaller than, than the horses that the uh, Euro-Americans are going to use. He can ride into battle with his leg slung over the neck of his pony, shooting arrows out from underneath the neck of the pony. And he can shoot them fast enough to keep an arrow in the air at all times. And he can shoot those arrows with such force that they can go through a bison. And, you know, I used to read that and I used to think, no way, I've seen a bison, you couldn't possibly put an arrow through it. And I, many years ago, taught at MIT. And so I uh, got one of my engineer students who had, was at the time in a PhD program, hi Clint, and asked him if in fact uh, an arrow could go through a bison. And he did the calculations and said, yeah, you could actually, the force would be enough to send an arrow through a bison. So they're fighting at this level. They are uh, incredibly quick fighters. They can keep a weapon, a, a deadly weapon in the air at all times. And they are coming up against Euro-Americans who are tied to, at that time, um, uh, guns that are in the, before the Civil War that are not rifled, so they are not accurate at all. And they take, you know, a really good marksman 45 seconds to, to clean and load and shoot. Well, in 45 seconds, you're, you're done uh, if you're facing that kind of weaponry. That's going to change, of course, when we get the six-shooter, which is why the six-shooter becomes so popular out of Texas, and when we later on get a different kind of weaponry in the late 19th century. But in the early 19th century, the Comanches, the Apaches, the... Um, 
the Kiowa, the Cheyenne, and the Lakotas are going to be extraordinarily dangerous fighters for the American army or American settlers to come up against. They are, in fact, the most formidable fighters Americans will be uh, engaging with, except themselves, until World War I. And so this is a real game changer for what's going to happen in the American West and how that's going to affect the American psyche. So. Um, the first thing that happens is the Santa Fe Trail, as I said, runs directly uh, through Comanche and later Apache land. And at first, the Apaches have a pretty good relationship with Euro-Americans because they both hate Mexicans at that point. Um, but quickly in the 1840s, the Apaches have had enough of the Americans coming through their land and they start to push back. And there's a couple of really dramatic events, but um, most importantly for my, uh, from, from my purposes today is a major battle that takes place in, um, in, the, in 1854. And that you'll remember that 1854 is an important date back east too, and I'm going to pull them together in just a second. In 1854, a beef, uh, beef uh, contractor blames the Apaches for stealing his cattle, and the U.S. Army is like, okay, we're done. We're going to end these skirmishes once and for all. So they march out and they engage the Apaches in a dramatic battle near um, Pilar, New Mexico. And at first, in the first of the battles, um, I'm always nervous about reading Spanish or saying Spanish names because I get so nervous about it, I mispronounce it. Um, the Battle of uh, Cienaguilla, I actually wrote that down. Um, so that I would make sure I, I try to pronounce it right anyway. In 1854, um, the Apaches win and they manage to rout the US soldiers uh, and lose very few of their own people. But a week later, army scouts find the band and they're actually, the army scouts are actually led by Kit Carson. Kit Carson's like everywhere in the late 19th century. Um, he, uh, he finds them and he finds them in their winter quarters in Oyo Caliente Canyon. And at the Battle of Oyo Caliente, um, the US Army wins and uh, drives the Apaches away from their winter encampment, which is near the hot springs there. And that essentially ends the full engagements of the Apache Wars. But it establishes a couple of things. First of all, it establishes that, um, that there, the Apaches and the Americans are not going to be getting along. That's going to create long-standing simmering anger that's going to play out in about three minutes. Um, it also, um, I, this is one of my favorite tidbits in American history, it also prompts the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, to decide that the U.S. Army needs to be better equipped to fight the Apaches and to fight the Comanches. And so in this, in this dry, desert-like area, and so he actually imports 34 camels from the Mediterranean to try and make sure the army stays supplied in the Southwest. And this is known as the Camel Corps. And um, I, there are a number of fun novels about it. And as far as I'm concerned, there cannot be enough novels about the Camel Corps. And I still, uh, I still love the idea of being out in the Southwest in that era and seeing camels. Um, Anyway, the reason that I put a focus on that particular battle is because that is, of course, the year that Congress passes the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And with that Kansas-Nebraska Act, this entire new region of um, that has been, uh, the Americans have taken over after um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is suddenly up for grabs. Like what's going to happen in this new region? Because the Kansas-Nebraska Act, if you remember, I kind of made a big deal about this last week, only covers the, uh, I'm sorry, the Missouri Compromise, not the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Missouri Compromise only covers the Louisiana Territory. So now all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch more land. Is that going to be land for slavery or is that going to be land for free labor? And that's not at all clear. And all this is coming to a head right while those Southern slaveholders are in fact trying to take over the American government. So it's not clear at all what's going to happen in this new land taken over by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Well, Americans in the East are fighting about Louisiana territory and the Missouri Compromise, and Stephen Douglas is trying to get through Congress the Kansas-Nebraska Act, saying that slavery can spread here. Everybody else is wondering what's going to happen with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is why things are going to get so bad so fast in the 1850s. So under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, one of the things it says is that, you know, the border just moved over a whole bunch of people. So what it says is that anybody who lives in the region that had been Mexican and now is American, they get to decide whether or not they want to move back to Mexico or stay in America. But the presumption is if they stay in America, they are going to become American citizens. They get a year to decide. The presumption is that they're going to be American citizens, but the treaty never says when. 
it also, uh, the treaty also says that all of their land is going to be protected as if, you know, their, their rights to land are going to be protected. But again, the treaty doesn't really say how. So what happens after that is that, um, as I said, the treaty says this, but immediately Americans start pouring west in order to mine the gold that's been discovered in California. About 150,000 uh, Indians already live in that land, and Mexicans too start to move over into California to try and start digging there. And Mexicans, you'll remember, have a history of mining, so they have a pretty good sense of how to do it. At the same time, Americans from the east who are trying to, who want to get in on making their fortunes, move west and move west into those diggings. So what's going to happen almost immediately after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is that the Americans who are moving east into the California diggings thoroughly resent both the Indians who are already there and the Mexicans who are also moving into the region. And the Americans are going to start killing those people. First, they're going to enslave the Indians who are in the diggings. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. They are also going to start to uh, lynch the Mexicans, the Mexican Americans who are in, in that region as well. Um, there's been some wonder, uh, I, I should say, when I use the word wonderful historically, I don't mean I'm supporting it. I mean, I'm impressed by the work of fellow historians. There's been some wonderful work on the lynching of Mexican Americans in California, um, uh, where the historians discovered that at least 163 Mexicans were lynched in California between 1848 and 1860. These are rates of uh, assassinations that are comparable um, to the rates of lynching in the American South in the early part of the 20th century. The percentages are really quite high. And more interesting for my purposes today, those lynchings also involve the mutil mutilation of the bodies of the Mexicans who were lynched. And mutilation of bodies is a really important thing psychologically in human history. If you mutilate a body, of a of a of a foe of a deceased foe you are denying that person humanity you are saying that they're that they are not of value that they are somehow less than you so the mutilation of the corpses of the lynched mexicans actually matters um, so it actually matters sort of historically as opposed to simply mattering for the families and the people who themselves were lynched. It's part of a larger historical pattern is what I'm going to suggest. It, it really establishes that Americans don't see the Mexicans as fully human, even though according to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they were supposed to be fully human. And by the way, that's gonna come back in a couple of weeks. It's gonna come back to haunt American history. Similarly, uh, Chinese immigrants to America run afoul of the white miners who believe that land is now theirs. Uh, Chinese men came to America because the opium wars had so completely devastated China. They did not plan to stay. They were not legally allowed to emigrate from China. So they expected to send money home and then to go home themselves. And as a result, they never even tried really to integrate to American life and to the American diggings and the mines. But, um, but that wouldn't have mattered. The American mine or I shouldn't say it wouldn't have, who knows how the history would have gone. It is unlikely that would have mattered. Um, American miners really wanted no part of uh, the Chi their Chinese neighbors who were also working in the diggings. And in fact, they began to push the Chinese workers, the Chinese miners into the areas that they had already worked. Nonetheless, the Chinese are meticulous about the way that they work those leftover diggings and they begin to do quite well in what they know as Gold Mountain. So this matters today for my purposes because in 1850, almost immediately, if you think about it, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848, people rush in to mine, 1849, 1850, California is desperate for some kind of a body of laws because you've got all these men running around from all these different places and they're fighting and they're killing each other and it's a free for all, they want some sort of a legal system. So a legislature, the California legislature, California state organizes, and in order to put together a body of laws, the legislature writes a set of laws that guarantees that white men are going to dominate all the other groups that are out there. And what they do is they write into American law a series of racial hierarchies that establishes that white men are going to control the economy and also to control politics. So first of all, and, and you know, I'm talking about the 1850s and, and it's interesting for historians, but you sit there and you think, ah, eh, a long time ago. 
this this so matters because of the way they do it the way they do it is going to affect reconstruction in next week but it's also going to get written into american western law uh, until at least until uh, the 1960s. Um, and I'm going to explain how that happens. First of all, California adopts a law that was written in 1802. It's a series of laws, but it's actually codified as a, as a unit in 1802. And that series of laws limits American citizenship to, as they say, free white persons. And obviously what the American Congress was trying to do when it wrote that law in 1802 was it was trying to say that um, the enslaved peoples who were being brought over could not become citizens. So it limits citizenship to free white persons. Cal the California legislature picks that up in 18, I'm sorry, 1850, yeah, 1850, and says, citizen, it says, um, citizenship is limited to free white persons, and African Americans and Indians, or anybody who has black or Indian blood, cannot testify in court against white people. Now, let me walk that you through that for a minute. If you can't testify against somebody, you have no rights, because they can do anything, and you can't speak up about it. So what that says right there is that white people white men in this case, can get away with anything against any crimes that they commit against Indians or black people. It also prohibits marriage, interracial marriage, and um, and it, it, does, it does one other thing I'll tell you about. At the same time it does all this, it permits um, white men to, uh, to have quite a lot of rights. For example, it allows all white men to vote and, um, and gives a white man all equal rights. Uh, as soon as they do this, uh, California accepts this, these, these rules and California gets admitted to the, Cong uh, to the United States in 1850. And this is a baseline for the governments of Western states. Then as soon as California becomes a state in 1850, it ups the, the racial categories in its laws. So um, it, it for example, uh, takes the land or it permits white men to take the land of Indians so long as they provide different land for those Indians. So what it says is that we can take your valuable land so long as we give you some crap land somewhere else. So what that does is it redistributes Indian land, especially Indian land with gold on it, to white men. Similarly, it permits Indian children to be enslaved until they are grown. Uh, it also says that Indian women who are married to white men can give up their land to those white men so long as they tell the, the courts that they are not under any duress to do it. Well, you can imagine how that's going to go. Similarly, the new California laws um, permit any uh, permit the police to punish an entire tribe for any transgression committed by a member of the tribe. And it also um, goes after uh, first Mexicans by saying that anybody who was uh, not not known to be a hard worker and who was loitering about the streets could go in could be sentenced to jail or to a thousand dollar fine. Um, it and at it, it, first it doesn't sound like it's clear who that's going to be, um, but the the they clarify that later when they actually call it. And I'm sorry for for the 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 racist term here. Uh, they punish. Uh, they punish vagrancy for a certain class of people with um, either a fine or, I'm sorry, sorry, 90 days of hard labor, and they actually call that law the greaser law, and they refer to um, any that as anybody who is the issue of Spanish or Spanish and Indian blood. Similarly, they go after the Chinese, and this really matters in just a minute. They go after the Chinese with attacks on their mining. And then uh, in 1852, and then in 1854, they establish that Chinese people can't testify against white people in court. So what this means is that they have established a, a, a system in California that is a legal system against the equal rights of anybody except white men. And this replicates, if you will, what I was talking about back east. And I'm not up to the Civil War yet. So, what happens from that is that Americans back east are watching this and people like Abraham Lincoln are horrified. Not only Abraham Lincoln, but um, William Henry Seward, for example, looks at what's happening in California and says, 
you guys are writing into law in the 1850s the very kind of hierarchies that we th we oppose that look like exactly like a form of enslavement or we're working toward a form of enslavement that looks very much like, like what's happening in the American South. And this is when Abraham Lincoln quite famously writes his fragments down on a sheet of paper, a little piece of paper, in which he says, if A can prove, however conclusively, that he may have right enslaved B, why not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? And then he goes, you say A is white and B is black. What's color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker? Well, take care. By that rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You didn't mean color exactly. You mean the whites are intellectually the superiors of the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them? Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. And then he goes a little bit further and he says, but say it was a question of interest. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. And if you can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. And starts to think about this and then his his friend Joshua Speed writes to him and says you know what do you think about this party that's rising in the east that keeps down Irish and the Irish immigrants and Lincoln says I don't belong to that group this is a quote how could I be it how could anybody who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor or degrading in favor of degrading classes of white people when it comes to this, I should prefer, prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of li loving liberty. To Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. So back east, people like Lincoln saw what was happening in the West and they hated it. They didn't want any part of these categories, these hierarchies being written into American government. And in fact, in the uh, Republican platforms of 18, 1856 and 1860, they say, we are all in favor of immigrants being welcome on equal terms to American society, which was a dramatic thing to be saying in the 1850s as these other people, both in the South and the, and the West, are saying, no, we're gonna have categories of Americans. So as soon as the war breaks out, the American Congress under Abraham Lincoln works really hard to take in the American West in such a way that they're going to spread their version of America and not the Confederates version of America into those Western lands. And if you think about it, before the Civil War, the American West looks on maps rather empty. It doesn't have any lines. Uh, what that means is that land is controlled by the indigenous peoples who own the land. By 1865, Americans from the US Congress have imposed over that land and uh, an organizational system of territories and states that looks virtually like it does at the present. They won't have separated out the territory of Wyoming, which happens in 1868, and they will not have divided Dakota territory in half, which happens in 1889. But they have tried to take that entire region and to settle it, again, on indigenous lands, and that's another part of the story that I will get to in a bit. Um, they have tried to settle it with their version of democracy, with their version of free labor. And they really think by the end of that war that it's worked, that they have managed to go ahead and erase that oligarchical system across the West with their new version of democracy. But having set all this up, what I would like to argue uh, is that in fact, the Civil War, rather than demolishing the idea of hierarchies in the American West, it exacerbated them. And when it exacerbated them, it made it a perfect place for the oligarchical system of the Confederacy to grow and live again. And how that happened is a, it makes Indian history, American Indian history, central to our understanding of American history. Because what happens during the war between the US government and American settlers and the indigenous peoples in the Plains Wests cements the idea of hierarchies into the American West. And that, with that idea cemented there, it's going to welcome the, Ameri the, the Southern idea of oligarchy into that growing American West where it is going by the 20th century to sweep back East from the West and again, take over American government. So what happens in the West during the Civil War is a number of their own wars out there. Americans tend to think that when uh, Robert E. Lee surrenders the um, Army of Northern Virginia to 
brought uh, to uh, Ulysses S. Grant on August 9th, I'm sorry, April 9th, 1865. Uh, I'm trying not to date these, uh, these lectures because they'll live on the internet, but of course that's the anniversary of that is today. People tend to think that when Lee surrenders to Grant, the war ends. The war does not end. Even the Civil War does not end. Uh, there are still two armies in the field and they're not gonna surrender for a while. But even after uh, the majority of those armies surrender, there's gonna be a few outliers. Even after those armies surrender, the war is still not over. America is still very much at war on the plains with the indigenous peoples there. And in, in, to recognize that, in fact, um, the US Army moves William Tecumseh Sherman, who has just subdued the South, to the Department of the Missouri, where he's going to be theoretically leading the fight against the Plains Indians. He's a kind of hand, hands-off leader, and I'll talk more about that uh, in the future. But what happens during the Civil War on the Plains matters. And it matters because, as I say, it establishes the idea that the West really should, is, and should be a land of hierarchies. So how does that play out? It plays out beginning in January of 1861, when the troubles between the Apaches and the US Army open up again because of an army leader um, named George Bascom, Lieutenant George Bascom. And what I'm going to lay out here is known in the history books as the Bascom Affair. What happens is a group of Apaches steal a bunch of cattle and a kid, a boy, from a ranch in Arizona. And Bascom goes out to get the, the land, I'm sorry, get the animals and the boy back. But he, he blames the wrong set of Apaches for launching the raid. So the leader of that other set of Apaches is a great leader named Cochise. And you probably recognize that from the Die Hard movies when Mel Gibson keeps calling um, is it Danny Glover in that movie? Keeps calling Danny Glover Cochise. It's not goat cheese he's saying. He's saying Cochise is the leader of the Apaches. Anyway, Cochise is a great leader of the Apaches. And he meets with Bascom and he says, yeah, I'll find the guys. It wasn't my people, but it, you know, I'll find the guys and we'll get them back. Bascom wants no part of it. And instead, he imprisons Cochise along with his wife and two children and uh, Cochise's brother and his nephews. Cochise actually slashes his way out of the tent where he is imprisoned with a knife, but the rest of his party stays behind, and, and Bascom refuses to let Cochise's family go. Cochise then uh, attacks a group of traders to uh, warn Bascom that he's not playing around, and the traders are primarily Mexicans. He kills nine of the Mexicans, and he captures three Americans and offers to trade the Americans for his family once again, um, uh, Bascom refuses, and Cochise then kills the Americans and mutilates their bodies for Bascom to find. Um, in mid-February, in retaliation, Bascom's people hang uh, Cochise's brother and his nephews, and that puts the Apaches and the U.S. Army in all-out war. And with, uh, within a year, Cochise has allied with this really famous Apache leader named Mangus Coloradus to go ahead and fight against the Americans and drive them out of their land. Uh, another person fighting with them, of course, is Geronimo. And this is where Geronimo enters into uh, American history and also American folklore. Um, so that is going on. That war is going on in the Southwest. But the Southwest, for the most part, has a series. Has, there's been such contact for so long between the Americans and the, um, the indigenous peoples who live there that they kind of have a relationship. It might not be a good one, but they know each other. The same is not true in the Northwest, in the Northern Plains, and uh, where, where American settlement has been quite late. Um, the, and what happens during the Civil War is that in 1862, um, the Dakotas in what is now Minnesota are starving because they have given up their land in 1851 with the influx of American settlers in 1851. Uh, the Dakotas are forced to give up their land and move on to quite a small reservation along the Minnesota River. When that happens, they're supposed to be getting food and clothing and provisions as well as an annuity from the U.S. government. And the U.S. government always funds those annuities. There's a long history of, of the relationship between Congress and American Indians there. Uh, but they do, in fact, almost always fund those. That doesn't mean the Indians get, get them, but it means Congress funds them. One of the very few times they don't do that is 1862. In the middle of a civil war, Congress is skint. It's got no money, and the place where they don't put in the money is in funding the Indian treaties. So in 62, the Indians who were supposed to be getting food and provisions 
aren't getting their food and provisions. The, um, the Indian agent who is supposed to be providing those for them actually has them, but he hasn't been paid for them, so he won't hand it out. So in the summer, of, the late summer of 1862, just when it looks like the Americans are going to lose against the Confederates on the battlefields, the, the starved young men of the Dakota tribe fight back against the Americans who have taken over their land, saying, you know, you, you're not abiding by the treaty, we're not going to either. And in the course of what becomes known as the Dakota War, uh, between 400 and 800 Americans are killed, and it takes the military coming into Minnesota to put down what Americans call an uprising. The, the, it matters that this happens in 1862, because right then, as it looks like America is on the ropes, these indigenous people rise up, and when the men are all gone from Minnesota fighting the war, they rise up and they begin to, to kill settlers. And as opposed to sounding like a battle somewhere in the West, this looks like an, a direct attack on America itself. And that's how it plays in the media. And, and people are outraged that this has happened. And military officials actually want to execute every single one of the Dakota men who um, who surrender after the military comes and surrounds them. And it's over 300 people. And they arrange military courts that are essentially kangaroo courts. Sometimes it takes 15 minutes to sentence somebody to death. And they, um, they hand down death sentences for all of the Dakota men who surrender after this uprising. And, and Lincoln takes one look at this and he realizes he's got a huge problem on his hands. He says, I can't execute men for fighting against the government because if I do that to these Dakota men, what are we gonna do about the Confederates? And if we start executing all the Confederates, then they're gonna start executing all, all of us. So we've gotta come up with some different system for how to handle what you do with people who have been fighting against your government. And he does two things. First of all, he, he reads all of the transcripts himself of all of the trials, even though the military men are saying, we'll take care of it, we'll just go ahead and execute them and you don't have to, to trouble your pretty little head about it. He's like, no, we're setting a precedent here. And he commutes the sentences of any Dakota who is accused of killing somebody in battle. He simply retains the, the, uh, the death sentences of anybody who is convicted of rape or of murdering somebody who is not on a battlefield. Nonetheless, um, in, on December 26, 1862, the US military hangs 38 Dakota men for their participation in the Dakota War in the largest mass execution in American history. And why every American doesn't know that, I do not know. Now you all do. Uh, the other thing Lincoln does is he turns to one of his great theoretical thinkers, Francis Lieber, and he says, we need to figure this out. Like, when is it okay to kill someone? He puts it probably much more elegantly than I just did. And Francis Lieber sits down and comes up with what's known as the Lieber Code, which is the first real set of guidelines people have for what is permissible in wartime and what is in fact a war crime. And the Lieber Code goes on to inform our later definitions of what constitutes a war crime. Meanwhile, the Dakotas who survived the, the Dakota War run west to their Lakota relatives further out in what are now uh, North and South Dakota and into Montana. Uh, and, uh, and saying to them, you know, the Americans are coming for us and they are, they just executed a whole bunch of us and the Lakotas are like, you know, we don't even see Americans, we're fine out here. In the meantime, there's a further dehumanization of the Indians taking place in 1862. And what happens there is that after the Confederates push into Arizona and New Mexico, the US Army rushes in and pushes the Confederates back out of Arizona and New Mexico. And after they do that, um, the, both the Confederate men have pulled out of the territories of Arizona and New Mexico. And then the Union men um, are uh, don't, is tend not to there tend not to be a lot of union men in those territories as well. And when that happens, the um, the Navajo tend to start raiding American ranches and um, start to stealing steal American um, American goods in this in their land. And uh, when that happens, both the Apaches and the Navajos are taking advantage of the chaos that's down there in these territories. And in late 1862, the army orders uh, uh, a fort in the 
um, in the region to protect the settlers, and this is going to be known as Fort Sumner. Um, and next to it, he lays out a reservation known as Bosque Redondo, where he hopes to pull the Apaches and the Navajos in and turn them into farmers. Um, then in 62, uh, the leader of the, um, of the army down there goes to war with the Apaches and with the Comanches. And he, uh, I'm sorry, with the Apaches, not with the Comanches, goes to war with the Apaches under Cochise and under Mangus Colorados. And he orders uh, the army to kill any Apache men, even if they are surrendering, even if they're under a flag of truce, because he says they are treacherous, which I think is an interesting lack of self-awareness. Anyway, he says you should kill anybody, the army should kill anybody. And he claims, as he said, this severity in the long run will be the most humane course that could be pursued toward these Indians. Uh, they, in fact, do manage to round up the Apaches and kill Mangus Coloradus, cut off his head, boil it, and send the skull back east to a prominent phrenologist who proclaims the skull proves he is a monster. Anyway, uh, with the Apaches uh, literally beheaded, their leader literally beheaded, uh, the army moves about 500 Apaches into Bosque Redondo and then turns to fight the Navajos. And under Kit Carson, they manage to round up the Navajos out of their quarters, out of their region um, in Arizona, and move them on a long march, what's known as the Navajo Long Walk, into Bosque Redondo, the Western equivalent of the um, Trail of tears that happens back east. What they have done then is they've moved the Apaches and the Navajos into Bosque Redondo, which although it was set up to be a reservation to teach farming, is essentially a concentration camp. They're going to die at really large rates. And in 1863, 1864, that's just fine with the army. Again, in this period of the Civil War, when life is being taken really quite lightly, the idea of Indians being concentrated in a place where they can't survive does not seem to army officers to be a problem. Uh, the, I'm not done yet. This dehumanization of Indians is going to continue in uh, in Colorado in 1864 after the long walk of the Navajo. In, in, 50, in 64 in Colorado, uh, the Cheyenne are in trouble because they have had in the 1850s also to give up their land and to be forced onto a small reservation in Colorado. And a number of the young men of the Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne bands refuse to accept the reality of that treaty. They say, we never signed it, we're not gonna be bound to it. And they continue to raid in Colorado territory. As people in Colorado, as the men in Colorado move back east in order to fight the war, the governor of Colorado, um, really can't handle the skirmishing that's going on between the settlers and the uh, Cheyenne dog soldiers. But more than that, he wants to exploit the, the skirmishes between them in order to cement his own political power. He's hoping to continue to be governor even after Colorado becomes a state. So eventually, in 1864, he issues a proclamation in which he authorizes all citizens, quote, to kill and destroy as enemies of the country wherever they may be found, all hostile Indians. Well, one of the things that Indian fighters always do, because it's way easier, is they tend to go after peaceful camps of native peoples rather than after the hostile bands, because the peaceful camps are easy to find. They're not hiding. And that's precisely what happens. On November 28, um, 1864, uh, the army falls on a group of Cheyennes uh, camped near Sand Creek, Colorado. They'd actually been relocated there by the army. Most of the men were out hunting, and the, the people in the camp or women and children and the elderly. And the next morning, the, the army falls on the Indians and massacres them despite the fact that the Indians instantly raise a white flag. They are not equipped to fight and they had actually already uh, begun working with the army. And the soldiers killed as many people as they could find. They ultimately killed between 150 women and children and about 25 men. Now, Sand Creek is important for the story I'm telling about the establishment of hierarchies in the American West, because once again, uh, US soldiers uh, butchered the bodies of the Cheyennes that they massacred at Sand Creek. And I won't go into the details. Um, they are horrific. But one of the things that happens with this butchery of the Cheyennes is that um, this news spreads back to the East and Congress is horrified at the news that their soldiers might have done this and they launch, launch an investigation, which is how we know about it. 
But Westerners look at the fact Easterners are complaining about the butchery of Cheyennes and they say, you just don't understand how bad it is here in the East. We need to put these people down. They are endangering our lives and you Easterners just don't get this. And that idea of Western Indians as being subhuman really takes off in the war and after 64 and after the Sand Creek Massacre because for um, for Americans who've got their brothers or their fathers or their husbands in the service, they don't want to believe that their soldier relatives could ever butcher a woman or take a man's body parts as a tobacco pouch. And so rather than saying, oh my God, we've got a problem here, our people need, our army needs to be cleaned up, they turn that into, the, our people would not have done that unless those people deserved it. And so to bring us in full circle about why this matters today and why this matters for the story in American history is that at the end of 65, I left you last week with the idea that American democracy is a land where everybody is created equal, had won back East. Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party and the U.S. armies on the field had won, and they had spread their version of democracy as equality across the East. They had destroyed the Confederacy and its hierarchical system of government in battle, and they had won this devastating war that had taken hundreds of thousands of lives and more than $5 billion, and it looked like Lincoln's version of America was going to win right up until 1870 when uh, when African-American men and women begin to, to, to argue that they should have a voice in society. And it looks like the Civil War has established equality for everybody and has erased that any unequal part of the American paradox. But just as that moment happens, Americans move to the West. They move into this region where hierarchies have been established for generations and where the recent Civil War has cemented those hierarchies into place through these Indian wars that took place even as the American Civil War was, was developing democracy in the East, it was establishing hierarchies in the West. And that different Western history, that history of hierarchies and the cementing of hierarchies in the West during the Civil War is going to change the trajectory of American democracy from this point forward. Sorry there was a screw up with the tapes. I hope that was interesting. And if it was, I will see you back here to do American history next Thursday at one o'clock. And if you are interested uh, on Tuesday, I do talks at four o'clock about American politics and how it relates to history. If you're interested in the story I'm telling here now, it's an expansion of what I'm arguing in my new book, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week.